everyone. I'm Anya Parampil, and this is Red Lines. My guest today is award-winning filmmaker, director, screenwriter, Oliver Stone. We're going to discuss his latest documentary, JFK Revisited Through the Looking Glass. Once you kill a president on the streets of American City, that sends a signal. The rights of every man are diminished when the rights of one man are threatened. If America really wants a democratic society, and we should get to the bottom of this thematic crime that continues to reverberate throughout American history. This nation will not be fully free until all its citizens are free. Welcome back to Red Lines, Oliver. Well, nice to be here, Anya. How have you been? I've been doing great. We just watched your film the other night. And I just have to ask you, considering I also recently watched your dramatic film, JFK, it's over three hours long. You really put it all out there. And that came out in 1991. You also explore the case of JFK in your Untold History of the United States series. So I'm very curious why you decided it was time to revisit JFK once again? Well, because the film created a furor. Congress passed an act, uh, an act of Congress that created the Records Review Board, which reinvestigated the and declassified a lot of the documents. They didn't do everything. They didn't weren't empowered to. And they were limited by time and money. They they sat from ninety four to 90, 1998. And they actually called a lot of people who changed testimonies and stuff like that. Declassified documents are very important and things changed. And all their results were ignored by the media. Uh, we're not surprised uh, just because it's a lot of detail. And that's how you solve this case. You, you use detail upon detail upon detail. That's what Sherlock Holmes would have done. But American people don't seem to have the patience for that. So it's broad. There's broad and, you know, broad sensationalism of who did it or uh, was there a conspiracy or no conspiracy? I mean, it gets silly. Uh, and th those facts were out there for years. T 2013 rolls around. It's very depressing to see that all the networks and all the cable shows closed around the Kennedy. Uh, they commemorate him, but they never really talk anything about the alternative theories about his, his murder and, or the reason he was murdered. All of which is very depressing to me. So I figure, you know, before I die, I think I'm going to try to get something down a record, a legacy, a record of what he actually, of what we actually found out through our film up to now. Yeah, and so viewers, when you say detail is the way you solve this case, you really put it in this documentary. Viewers, I encourage everyone, of course, to watch it, pay really close attention, and then watch the original JFK film from 91 as well. You just published a guest column in The Hollywood Reporter criticizing both presidents, Trump and Biden, for delaying the declassification of the Kennedy files. Why do you think now, 58 years on, it's still something the U.S. government isn't comfortable sharing with the U.S. public? Obviously, everybody's dead, but there's obviously some details that are important, especially, you know, the CIA never cooperated. They were stonewalling from the beginning. They stonewalled the Warren Commission because, well, Alan Dulles, who had been, had been there, was sitting on the board telling them what to do and how, uh, how to avoid all this stuff. And then years later, they stonewalled the House Select Assassinations Committee. We bring out the fact that George, one of the agents is assigned to, to work with a committee, and he turns out to have worked on the original case, but that's George Joannidis. And then now uh, they, they stonewalled the Assassination Records Review Board, and Tunheim explains what some of those instances. So uh, no cooperation. What we need is to get some files on some of those agents who are all around the case, like uh, David Atlee Phillips, like William Harvey, like George Joannidis. There's a ton of information there, but who knows where it is? Files are important, but of course, they you can shred files, they can lose files. The Secret Service, certainly, the Secret Service shredded. The, his, the, the committee asked them in 95, specifically, for files on the, the assassination planning in Tampa and in Chicago, and the Secret Service destroyed those files right there. It's illegal action, and they got away with it. So 
this is what was the question I got lost? I'm sorry. Why they point. don't want the truth out now? I mean, you. No. I assume that it would have, even though you say everyone's dead, that it would have an impact on the way we view our government, well, the see, way it I operates. Mean, the point is, once if you can, if you just show the American people that there was a coup d'état in 1963, their democracy was was taken away from them, and John Kennedy was moving in a huge new direction. That's what people miss. That's why he was killed. He wasn't killed because of some petty nonsense. He was killed because he was changing the way things were, and that's what's important in this case. And uh, I'll, I'll so get into we, what we question people... the basis of our government and people. Look, what's happened since Jack died? All these presidents, not one of them has been able to go against the military industrial complex or raise questions to the intelligence agencies. Their funding, they go on, they're autonomous, uh, they're autonomous arms of the government. They do what they want. They do it how they want. And nobody can supervise them. Nobody can stop them. And I think the Kennedy murder was almost a warning to any other president not to go too far. Remember when the Trump got into trouble with the his attacks on the FBI and the CIA, that was an instance of he went too far. And then Shermer said, oh, you better be careful. They can get you six ways from Sunday, the intelligence agencies. That's really that. You take on the intelligence community, they have six ways from Sunday at getting back at you. So even for a practical, supposedly hard-nosed businessman, he's being really dumb to do this. And Trump, of course, got buried in a bunch of contradictions and the, the agencies contributed a lot to his demise. A popular device. Last year, I interviewed you about your memoir, Chasing the Light, which again, viewers should read if they haven't already. And in it, you write about your experience serving in the Vietnam War and coming of age in the 60s. What does Kennedy represent to your generation? Well, uh, I don't want to get too, uh, you know, when he died, I didn't know anything about the case. I followed the usual conventional thoughts, not until 1988. There was a tremendous amount of protest though. Mark Lane and dozen other researchers, citizens without any income or just did this because they were cared and they went very far. And there was a lot of a, the, 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 the protest against the Warren Commission grew into an, a roar in 19, by 1967. Of course, there was a lot, there was, a lot of intellectuals, all the American uh, people of power were questioning this thing. And it was a good thing. And unfortunately, and here there's a contradiction, the Jim Garrison trial in New Orleans, which accused, uh, which started the case, public case against uh, the killers, disintegrated uh, without enough evidence. And Garrison's trial did set this back. And after that, the 70s, it took about 10 more years for the, the House committee to come back again. There was that second investigation. And that, again, was torpedoed. And, and they, 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 uh, they uh, classified their files. Remember, they, they came to the conclusion that there was a conspiracy, but we never saw those files. Those are part of the files that are declassified. But in other words, every investigation has been derailed. Well, he certainly represented idealism, a new world. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, on civil liber civil rights, people have ignored. He fought very hard for the cause of uh, equal rights. And in the South, he under he he lost a lot of the uh, vote in the South by going up against the governor of Alabama and the governor of Mississippi. He sent troops down there to integrate two colleges. It's a big deal back then. And we, in the end of the documentary, we have George Wallace saying he's lost the South. Uh, the governor of Alabama says he's lost the South and in the fall, we're going to get rid of Kennedy. And that's what happened in the fall. They got rid of Kennedy. Uh, and, I think he, he represents hope, hope. And of, of course I haven't mentioned, but he was adamantly against the Vietnam war. I was much criticized for saying that in 91, but the files we have showed declassified without a doubt, Robert McNamara supported that conclusion. He was secretary of defense in his book after he, uh, which came out after my film, he said, Kennedy was leaving Vietnam, win or lose. He made that very clear. And this is exactly what you said earlier people miss about Kennedy. And I think especially I find in discussing his case with people from my generation, they 
have this kind of simplistic way of viewing him where they say, oh, he was an imperialist. He expanded the Vietnam War. He oversaw the Bay of Pigs invasion. Why would the intelligence community want to get rid of him? What do you okay, say to people? Back. Really, really quickly. I know you're interested in Latin American affairs, but he wouldn't go into Vietnam. But if he his part of the logic is he didn't he refused to go and attack Cuba. That was the plan. Eisenhower yeah. took that in motion. Bay of Pigs, he was supposed to have pre he was supposed to have folded under pressure and actually ordered American troops in. He never did. Mm -hmm. So he made a huge amount of enemies. He destroyed the confidence of uh, the military and the, and the and the CIA. They were ready to go into Cuba. This is very important to recognize. But if he didn't send troops to Vietnam, why would you send them to Cuba? He refused to send troops. And that was the reason he was killed, basically. And then in 1962, this story continues, Bay of Pigs was not over. By 62 in October, it becomes a crisis again and the military is ready to invade. They were ready to invade through 1962. They wanted to go in. The world is on the edge of a nuclear war with Russia and Kennedy is adamant he does not send American troops into Cuba. It would, uh, by the way, that would not have been easy either. Uh, people who ever studied the situation said it would have been a mess if he had, it would have been like Iraq. But uh, be that as it may, by sticking to those guns of being, I am not going to be a war president. I'm a peace president. And he fought for peace. That's what he was. He was not an imperialist. He, he had troops on the, he had advisors in Vietnam because he was, he, the whole gist of American foreign, you had to be elected in 1960. The way to get elected, you had to be a cold warrior. You had to be, there was no choice. But he, in the course of his three years, became a warrior for peace and that, is what people from your generation have to understand. And yeah, I, I remember reading in the book, uh, JFK and the Unspeakable, that the intelligence community, community actually had a plan to go ahead with Bay of Pigs with a, an essentially a false flag operation in the event that Kennedy squashed the operation because they were actually so concerned that he would uh, go ahead and just say no because of the way he viewed the situation. And I noticed actually you start your film with Kennedy's address at American University when he's defining himself as a peace president. And that definitely gets lost uh, when it comes to people in my generation. And that is the most important topic on earth, peace. What kind of a peace do I mean? And what kind of a peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana enforced on the world by American weapons of war, not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave. I am talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living, the kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and build a better life for their children, not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women, not merely peace in our time, the peace in all time. I wanted to share with you something that I read actually in um, the memoirs of Andrei Gromyko. He's the he was the foreign minister of the Soviet Union for 30 years throughout the Cold War. And he writes very fondly of Kennedy. And he actually said that the secretary of state told him at that point, this was in September of 1963, that Kennedy was considering withdrawing troops. He wanted to draw down U.S. troops in Europe. This not is considering, not considering. He issued an order. It was in an ensam, and it was confirmed by McNamara's memoirs. Also, there's declassified files from the 63 May 63 meeting when he McNamara. We are taking 1,000 men out by 1963, the end of 63. And those are men, and those are units, not men. And then on top of that, we're going to withdraw by 65. Uh, McNamara backs that completely. So does, uh, by the way, McGeorge Bundy, his national security advisor. I was attacked so much on that issue. But I have to say, there's dozens of people who have come out since yes. then and said that he was clearly withdrawing from Vietnam. But he had to play the game because he couldn't withdraw when he it was he was vulnerable. It was this, his election oh. was coming up. This was uh, actually that he wanted to withdraw NATO troops from Europe, have a drawdown of, of pressure yes. uh, against the Soviet Union oh, as yeah. well. Across the board, he was going for detente with Khrushchev. Forget Gromyko. Gromyko was good, but Khrushchev himself said that he was the mo he mourned Kennedy's death like Castro yep. did, like yep. de Gaulle did, 
because they saw in him a man who could talk peace with them. He was not a cold warrior, one of those Washington uh, uh, hawks. There was all hawks in those days because we had the we did have the nuclear. We had a nuclear ability way beyond the Russians, and we knew it. And we and they wanted to use it. They wanted to bomb Russia, get get it over with. Do you remember Doctor Strangelove? That was the mentality. Get rid of them now, because if we don't, if we let them survive, they're going to build up into a force even greater, and they'll be equal to us. And that happened in the 1970s to a degree, and, and that's what motivated Reagan to become such a cold warrior. And Kennedy, uh, I can say one thing about what you said about. I don't know anything about this false flag operation. I do, there, I do know that declassified files from my film did reveal there was a major false flag operation called Operation Northwoods, yes. which they presented to Kennedy to blow up air, an airliner with people in it to attack America in, in various ways like 2001 and create this anger against Cuba. They tried everything against Cuba. Kennedy threw out the plan. He thought it was ridiculous. He thought these people were insane. I'm wondering, you you mentioned, you've spoken about this publicly, about the difficulty you had in finding a U.S. distributor for this film. Can you talk about that at all? Sure. Uh, we, we couldn't find financing for the film either. It was out of England. It was a company called Ingenious, a very new company that gave us the, the and they backed us all the way, although we had many difficulties. We showed the film at Cannes this year, Top Film Festival. We showed it at Deauville. We showed it at Rome. Great reactions. We sold 10... 10, 11 countries right away, nothing from America. So we had, a, we had an issue here. Uh, you know, who's going to distribute something like this? In the old days, I was lucky to get Warner Brothers because they, they were, I was in a different position. Uh, now uh, it's a different ballgame. It's much more conservative in this country since 2001. And uh, finally, Showtime stepped up, and I'm very, very grateful for that. And it's a, it's a chance. So we have a platform in America. No, no, uh, no major media have even uh, commented on the film except one attack in Rolling Stone, but uh, no major media. That Do you find you that in the? Did you find that in Europe there's more of an acceptance of this narrative? Yes, because they know. I think the French certainly know something happened. The Germans—they're not stupid. They've been around for centuries. It takes a certain naivete to believe. Uh, that a man, a lone nut who doesn't have any motivation would kill the president like that with three shots from so far away from the rear moving. It just, it's so crazy. It's just impossible. It's impossible for any marksman to do that, much less a mediocre marksman. It's absolutely impossible to believe the official narrative after watching your first film. But this one really, as, as you say, as I said earlier, is just, you get into the microscopic detail, all of the people involved in witnessing the case and testifying before the various investigations. So just to wrap, what do you hope people take away from this film? Because for me, JFK is one of, he's one of the most talked about presidents of all time. One of the most, the names we hear most often in U.S. history. And yet I think he's one of the most misunderstood. That's correct. That's correct. It's too bad because, uh, I think the the best books to read are James Douglas's uh, JFK and the Unspeakable and David Talbot's Brothers, which is a great book in 2007. Uh, and you can also read Talbot's other work. Uh, but there's many people who've written about this and it, it does get, the, the historians have not come along yet. They're, they're slow. They think that Johnson, Lyndon Johnson continued the policies of Kennedy. But in, except for civil rights in all the cases, every foreign country that was involved, all, he was the opposite. He was 180 degrees opposite. He went back to the old ways of doing business from John Foster Dulles and Eisenhower. So that's one thing that people can take away, get their history right. Because unless you have a sense of American history, you're going to be confused as to where we are now. People are confused by all this commotion. Everything has gone kind of haywire in a sense. And they're all, they don't know the source of this, but you have to go back to World War II and what America's policies coming out of that war be, be, were, and how we became a national security state, and how we, why we went to the militarization of our economy. Why? This is all very important because Kennedy's at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know what's going on now, go back then and find out. That's sort of what I have to say.
you say it was a coup d'etat and it's true. Everything changed from that moment on. And Kennedy himself was very uniquely positioned to take it on as someone who was an aristocrat. He was comfortable in his rank. He didn't have to prove anything to the people who control our government. And that made him a threat. And I think people like, just don't understand that about him. Like Franklin D. Roosevelt, he was a traitor to his class. Do you yes. remember? Roosevelt mm -hmm. hated by uh, the elite. So was Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy was also a warrior. He had been in World War II as a, and had been performed heroically. So he had no. He'd been abandoned, he, right? And he had wasn't just. Up, he wasn't looking up to these generals as if they knew everything. Like when every president comes along, oh, the military is great. They know what they're doing. They don't. And that's what Kennedy said. You can't trust these generals. They're a bunch of idiots. <laughs> He'd nearly died. He was in the middle of the ocean and I think had to swim, bringing two of his fellow uh, men with hero. him to an island. Something, some crazy survival story I remember reading about. Oh, it, was but... a long, it was a long ordeal. Yes. But he knew war and he, lived, he knew pain. He lived in pain all his life. <laughs> it was a hell of a story. The more you know about him, the more you admire him. Yeah. And, but there's been a lot of people whose job in life is to detract from his because he's dangerous. He's a dangerous figure. Anybody who is a reformer who tries to do this becomes a dangerous figure to certain types of people who go after him. Well, you've done an incredible job. I think you've changed, you've broken through and, and changed the way people think about JFK. Obviously, your first film led to actual hearings and change in U.S. government policy. So hopefully this will be the push that we need over the edge to get those last few files. But at well, least people have to see it. It's on Showtime. So maybe it'll come out a little bit wider in January. But Showtime is the only way right now to see it. It's worth the subscription. And and again, watch JFK from 1991 as well. It's a great film. Oliver, I really appreciate your time and appreciate all the work that you've done to bring the truth out about the Kennedy assassination. Thank you, Anya. Bless you. <laughs> Keep doing the work you're doing in Latin America. Mm -hmm.